Okay, kids, Arnold's is proud to present Weezer! <laughs> The Blue Album was a massive success, and with its release, Weezer had accomplished exactly what they set out to do. They made a hit album that everyone without a stick up their ass loved, kicking off a worldwide tour. However, all this acclaim didn't sit right with the man who worked the hardest to get it, the band's frontman, Rivers Cuomo. Fans ask me all the time what it is like to be a rock star. I can tell that they are dreaming as I dreamed when I was a kid of someday ruling the world with a rock band. I tell them the same thing I would tell any young rock star to be. Be prepared for a lot of Taco Bell. Be prepared for a lot of Subway. My Lanta figures big into your future. Buy a Walkman to block out the nonsensical ramblings of your brain-dead bandmates and advise them to do the same. Get used to writing letters from the road because only the biggest stars can afford all the calls you make when you get lonely. And you will get lonely. You will meet 200 people every night, but each conversation will generally last approximately 30 seconds and consist of you trying to convince them that no, you do not want their underwear. Then you will be alone again, in your motel room, or you will be on your bus in your little space trying to kill the nine hours it takes to get to the next city, whichever city it is. This is the life of a rock star. Clearly, Rivers wasn't totally satisfied with the new lifestyle that fame brought. That's why that last quote served as the closing paragraph to his college application essay. After the tour wrapped and his obligations had been met, he was going to get far, far away from everyone and everything and just study classical composition. That last bit being a remedy to possibly his greatest frustration while on tour, the total lack of creativity. All I'm doing is driving around in a van or tour bus and playing the same 10 songs every night and giving the same interview over and over. You know, after a year of that, I just felt extremely frustrated and like I was not going to reach my potential as an artist. The feelings of loneliness while on tour mixed with a desire for an entirely new artistic pursuit fed their way into a concept for the Blue Album's follow-up. Ever since Rivers borrowed his friend's Korg keyboard and wrote Buddy Holly, he pictured Weezer's second album being a synthy, new wave-influenced experiment. Buddy Holly, of course, ended up making its way on the band's debut, but he never lost interest in that sophomore concept. In fact, his distaste only emboldened him to take it in an even weirder direction. Not only a genre shift, but a tonal one. He was gonna make a rock opera. A concept album set in space with personal themes surrounding fame and love titled Songs from the Black Hole. Why'd you ditch the idea? ROTR. Plus, it was kind of a lame idea. Although a very short response to a very simple question asked on a fan forum, this is probably the best explanation for what happened to Songs from the Black Hole. ROTR is short for Return of the Rentals, the first album produced by Weezer bassist Matt Sharp's side project, The Rentals. At a time when Cuomo was struggling with his melancholic synthy new wave inspired album, here comes his best friend releasing a melancholic synthy new wave inspired album to critical acclaim. This definitely didn't help matters, but it probably wasn't the ultimate betrayal that it seems. Like I mentioned, Rivers was already struggling with the concept. That stems from April of 1995. It was the month that filming wrapped on the music video for Say It Ain't So and the end of the first leg of the World Domination Tour, basically a worldwide extension of the Blue Album Tour. In the eyes of many, this marks the end of the Blue Album era. It was the closing of a very mixed chapter in Rivers' life, but also the start of a new one. Just a few days later, on April 14th, Cuomo would get a corrective surgery. The frontman had been born with a rare condition that developed one leg shorter than the other, causing pain for much of his life. Now, he had the money and the free time to do something about it. He'd been told that the recovery would be painful, but hey, what's one bad summer in the face of a lifetime of happiness? Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot in the face of that. The procedure was in fact very painful as it involved breaking his leg and gradually pulling the bones apart over the course of months through the use of what Brian Bell called a contraption. A fucking thingamabob. Already mentally battered by his complicated relationship with the band's debut and fame, now too was his body turning on him, forcing him to live off of a quote, virtual pharmacopoeia of painkillers. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. Or rather, the gizmo that broke the singer's will to live. He would have to put up with this pain while continuing the world domination tour in June, and even performing on The Late Show with David Letterman, but thankfully, he would soon get the escape he was waiting for. 
Harvard University, baby. It seemed like the perfect place for him. He had all the time he needed to study and heal, far away from the fame, the groupies, the excess, the interviews, the friends, the loved ones. Completely untethered. It was miserable. I think many introverts can relate to this desire to just move far, far away and never speak to anyone ever again. And then you get that and just feel lonely. It wasn't good for his mental health, and it definitely wasn't good for his songwriting. I almost never put pen to paper anymore. I'm too scared to try. I'm afraid of writing line after line of crap until finally I'm forced to admit that I have absolutely nothing to say. He elaborated years later. I grew a long beard and walked around with a cane. The only time I could write songs was when my frozen dinner was in the microwave. The rest of the time, I was doing homework. It's only logical that the further away he got from who he was during the Blue Album tour, the more disconnected he was to the music he wrote during that tour. That brings us back to his second response to the fan interview. The whole idea of this whole rock opera started to feel too whimsical for where I was emotionally, going through the pain of the procedure. And so I scrapped the whole idea and went to a more serious and dark place. This new direction for the album recycled many songs from the original project. With Pinkerton keeping Tired of Sex, Get You, No Other One, and Why Bother, most of its first half was composed of Black Hole songs. The second half branched off a bit, with closer ties to Rivers' experiences at Harvard and the album's namesake. Cuomo had grown fascinated with opera as an art form while studying composition, more specifically the works of Puccini. One of which was Madame Ma Butterfly, the story of a US naval commander named Pinkerton who marries a 15-year-old Japanese girl only to leave her shortly after. His wife, Chocho-san, who he nicknames Butterfly, waits faithfully for his return for many years, refusing to remarry. Eventually, Pinkerton does return, but it's with a new American wife. He learns that Butterfly had his baby while he was gone and chooses to take the baby back to America. Yet, upon arriving at Butterfly's home, he's overwhelmed by guilt and runs away, leaving his wife and friends of Butterfly to break the news. Heartbroken, she says goodbye to her son, walks behind a screen, and loses her life in a way that will get this video demonetized if I elaborate further. It's a melancholic tale about love, desire, selfishness, betrayal, guilt, and loss. All these themes resonated with Cuomo, who listened to the opera over and over and ultimately chose it as the loose inspiration for Weezer's next album. Truthfully, Songs from the Black Hole didn't really vanish. It evolved into a different type of concept album. One that wasn't as blatant or flashy or set in space, but still centered around a few core themes. The 10 songs are sequenced in the order in which I wrote them, with two minor exceptions. So as a whole, the album kind of tells the story of my struggle with my inner Pinkerton. This struggle shines through on what is obviously a very autobiographical album. Tired of Sex tackles excess and shame. Get You is a bitter breakup followed by no other one as a regretful reunion. Why Bother is hopeless complacency, giving up on romance. Across the Sea is a lustful fantasy, triggering the good life as a wake-up call from all the bullshit, a glimmer of hope. El Scorcho sees Cuomo struggle to get back into romance, while Pink Triangle is an embarrassing failure in that realm. Finally, Falling For You sees him in a relationship that seems perfect, only for his own toxicity to ruin it all in Butterfly, when he realizes he was the problem all along. Themes like these are interesting enough on paper, but what really elevates Pinkerton is its authenticity. These songs went into detail, they brought receipts, with many referencing specific real-life events like Across the Sea's fan letter or Pink Triangle's lesbian crush, which would eventually go on to define the album, for good and for ill. But for now, we gotta record this damn thing. Although well and truly over his little Harvard experiment, Cuomo wasn't quite ready to drop out yet. Instead, the band would have to work around his breaks. As baffling as it sounds, that wouldn't even be the biggest change to Pinkerton's production. While on tour, the band fell in love with their live sound and decided they wanted to capture it on their follow-up album. So when Cuomo was out of school for winter break, the gang reunited without a producer in January of 1996 at Sound City Studios, the home of another sophomore album. Then they repeated the process for Cuomo's spring break, wrapping up production near the start of his summer break in June of 1996. All in all, it was a smoother operation than you might expect. Outside of a bit of perfectionism on Rivers' part, and Matt being unavailable for the last few sessions due to production of the rental second album, it was relatively uneventful. This was a much more experienced version of Weezer than the boys that recorded the Blue album. Shockingly, even the execs over at Geffen didn't cause any problems for Pinkerton. Todd Sullivan, a major player in getting Weezer signed and releasing the Blue Album, called it a very brave record, though he admitted it may show the band in a bad light. Still, overall, warm reception from the label. They quickly got to work choosing the album's first single, finally landing on El Scorcho, only for the operation to reach its first hiccup. 
Cuomo didn't want another Buddy Holly. He didn't want another quote-unquote gimmicky music video to tarnish what was supposed to be a very serious and personal album. Even for something a bit on the sillier side like El Scorcho, he just wasn't having it. He flat out turned down Spike Jones' pitch, the director of Buddy Holly and the Sweater Songs videos, and went in a totally different direction, with a video that was much lower budget and smaller scale. Still, Cuomo's ruthless perfectionism got to be too much for the video's director, as he quit shortly after filming, leaving the frontman to edit the whole thing himself. It wasn't the biggest conflict in the world, but it would be a red flag for the waters ahead. Shit was about to get choppy. El Scorcho released on September 19th, 1996, just a few days before the album was set to follow, and it didn't make quite the splash the band was expecting. I can't find any reviews from the time, but according to Rolling Stone, it was received lukewarm and the song peaked at number 19 on the charts. Regardless, not a good start for this anticipated follow-up. The song didn't do much better beyond its debut, slowly losing steam on MTV and the radio. When Pinkerton did finally debut on September 24th, it similarly didn't- oh, Sorry, gotta take that. Ahoy hoy. What? Weezer got sued by the Pinkerton Detective Agency over trademark infringement for two million dollars? This is gonna have massive ramifications on the album's release. I mean, just Im Oop, sorry, gotta take that. Ahoy hoy. Oh, the lawsuit got tossed immediately? because of all the Madam Butterfly references. Who would have thought? Pinkerton released as it was supposed to on September 24th, 1996, now with the added push of controversy making Weezer look like David standing up to Goliath. If Goliath was a union buster and David was really horny. Still, this good press wouldn't be worth much. Pinkerton ultimately debuted to middling reviews and even blander sales. Most of these negative reviews have been scrubbed from the internet, but here's one that remains. Hey boys and girls, can you say one hit wonders? If so, then follow it with Weezer. The band's second release, Pinkerton, clearly shows Weezer is headed to the graveyard of forgettable bands. Pinkerton is ten loud, grating songs that are supposed to pass as rock, but sound like trains going over rusty tracks. Three of the four band members say they do vocals, but it's hard to tell with the off-key, sometimes out-of-range wailing. This follow-up is a tremendous disappointment. Consider the hit the Weezers are best known for, Buddy Holly, was catchy and its video unique, but not this time. Pinkerton fails miserably. Of course, this is a more negative example of the album's critical reception, but it echoed a point that was quite common, the comparison to Weezer's debut. The Blue Album, as you likely know, was a critical and commercial darling, but not in the way that Rivers wanted. Cuomo saw it as super important, super powerful, heartbreaking heavy rock. Most people didn't pick up on that. The artist has since credited this clash to the album's metaphorical and disconnected lyrics, which led to a bit of a misunderstanding. The critical reaction to that record was that these people are goofy. They said there was no depth of emotion there. That really bummed me out in a big way, so I was determined to head in the other direction with the second record, and in the simplest, most direct language possible, talk about what was happening in my life and how I felt about it. And he did just that, making Pinkerton the most honest and confessional album he could. But by doing this, he alienated the many fans of the Blue Album. Artistically, it was a ballsy move. Commercially? Kinda stupid. I mean, the sexual aspect of the album alone was enough to discourage most listeners, but even instrumentally, the self-produced sound of the album that the band was so fond of completely contradicted what people came to expect from Weezer. Geffen and the band tried their best to save the album, choosing The Good Life, Pinkerton's poppiest offering, as its second single with a much more captivating music video. This one, again, failed to make a splash on the charts or on MTV. Then, foolishly, they chose Pink Triangle as the album's third and final single. This one completely bombed. The band was met warmly by fans around the world on a tour that would serve as Weezer's last effort to sell the album, but this would do very little to help sales or band morale. Pinkerton was soon voted the third worst album of 1996 by a Rolling Stone critics poll and fell off the Billboard charts in February of 1997. It was a failure. The album flopped. Rivers would later reflect on the album's reception years later. It was such a hugely painful mistake that happened in front of hundreds of thousands of people. It's like getting really drunk at a party and spilling your guts in front of everyone and feeling incredibly great and cathartic about it, and then waking up the next morning and realizing what a complete fool you made of yourself. He added, I got very sad. I became very unsure of my instincts. 
Rivers fell into a depression deeper than any before, or possibly after. However, this would ultimately have less to do with Pinkerton's reception, and more with a terrible accident. Michael and Carly Allen are a pair of names you'll know if you've spent any time in the Weezer fandom. That's because they were the founders of the Weezer fandom. As active followers of the underground LA rock scene in the early 90s, they became acquainted with many up-and-coming bands, though they likely got closer to none other than Weezer, forming the Weezer fan club, which is still in operation to this day. It can't be overstated how important they were in the early history of the band. That's why everything changed when Michael and Carly, along with their younger sister Trista, died in a car crash on the way back from a Weezer concert in Colorado on July 9th, 1997. I know this probably seems totally out of left field for those of you unfamiliar with the sisters, and I apologize for not bringing more focus to them before this moment, but their death was massively impactful. Weezer held a tribute concert with a few other bands on August 15th, 1997 in benefit of the Allen family. It would be Weezer's last show before an indefinite hiatus that changed the band forever. Pinkerton wouldn't stay a flop for very long. The late 90s and early 2000s would bring a new era of rock music that was much more accepting of raw, personal, confessional, emotional songwriting. This would be known in retrospect as the third wave of emo. I don't really know what emo means, but apparently I had something to do with it. Don't worry, Rivers, none of us really know what emo means either. What I've pieced together is that there are three relevant waves of the genre. While the first wave barely differentiated itself from punk and the second wave struggled to make a splash in the mainstream, the third wave's influences from pop punk led to a decade defined by emo. But this new generation of artists weren't solely taking cues from Green Day or Blink-182. Some of them found their inspiration in Weezer's second outing. Bands like Jimmy Eat World, Dashboard Confessional, Saves the Day, and Motion City Soundtrack have all paid their respects to the band, with the latter's frontmen even crediting Pinkerton directly. Not only is Pinkerton my favorite Weezer album, but one of my favorite overall albums of all time. It is messy, ugly, and raw. It is full of pain, humor, and brutal honesty. Let me put it this way. If Weezer were the movie Rudy, Pinkerton would be like playing for Notre Dame. The rest of the music world would soon follow. College radio stations started playing the singles, MP3s were shared on music forums and not entirely legal websites, and eventually even mainstream outlets gave the album a second shot. In 2004, Rolling Stone, the same outlet that voted Pinkerton the third worst album of 1996, re-reviewed it and gave it 5 out of 5 stars. The self-produced album sounds as raw as Cuomo's lyrics, without any of the sheen that Rick Ocasek provided on the band's debut. But what makes Pinkerton more than a blog entry is Cuomo's unfailing gift for power pop. In a matter of years, Pinkerton went from embarrassing to essential, and Cuomo was finally vindicated. And he fucking hated it. I don't like Pinkerton. It's a sh album. I wish people would leave it alone. Yeah, a lot happened during that hiatus. Rivers was Pinkerton's strongest soldier for the longest time, defending the album in countless interviews. But soon, he started internalizing all that criticism. Eventually, he grew ashamed of the album. And shame leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to the Green Album. This record is purely musical. There's no feeling. There's no emotion. Without getting too deep into details, the man basically tortured himself to make an album as different from Pinkerton as possible. Now, all of a sudden, the music world liked Pinkerton and thought he strayed too far from it. The situation justifiably pissed him off for a few years there, but over time, the wounds started to heal. Cuomo started to appreciate the album, even attempting to mimic its sound for the first half of Make Believe's production. Eventually, he wholeheartedly accepted its newfound appreciation. Right around 2001, when we put out the Green Album, I said a lot of negative, inflammatory things about Pinkerton, and about a lot of things. But ever since, I've been trying to make it clear that, of course, I think it's a brilliant album. I love it. I love the songs, and I love playing those songs, and I hope the positive message gets through. At first, hearing that quote, I thought he was referring to an underlying positive message in the album. That was kind of a wild goose chase. He meant the positive message of his love for the album. Pinkerton didn't have a positive message. It was a brutally honest exploration of the worst two years of the artist's life. An exploration with glimpses of hope that ends with the utterly hopeless butterfly. However, there is a positive message to be found from the story of Pinkerton. The story I've been telling this whole video. The story of Rivers Cuomo doing the exact opposite of what anyone else would have done in his shoes. 
Rather than mindlessly enjoying the rock and roll life, he defied it. Rather than ignoring the darker side of his mind, he analyzed it. Rather than making a carbon copy sequel to the Blue Album and raking in the cash, he made Pinkerton. That took guts, and it eventually paid off. In 2016, just eight days before Pinkerton's 20th anniversary, the album was certified platinum. I'll leave you with a quote from River's Diary. The heart is no good without the head, as the head is no good without the heart. When either gives in, or either takes over, both head and heart and I will wither and die. If you liked the video, like the video. If you liked me, subscribe. I have more videos, so you should watch those videos. Thank you. Special thanks to Weezerpedia, Rolling Stone, and the Pinkerton Diaries. They are the most helpful sources for the video. Go check them out. And special thanks to you for sticking around till the end. Comment cello jello if you did. I'm running out of time. I'll see you later.